So we've worked through, we've got a transmission coefficient in the limit where the energy of the tunneling particles is significantly smaller than the barrier height. And we've seen that there's an exponential dependence on the barrier width. And also there's obviously a dependence of the transmission coefficient on the relationship between the energy and of the particles and the height of the barrier. But as we've said before many times, the wave packet representation is what we really need to represent a, a particle in quantum mechanics. Plane wave solutions aren't normalizable in the context of single particles. So the, the, we need the wave packet, we need the, the various different plane waves with different um, spatial frequencies, different values of K to give us the right mixture and a Fourier integral to represent our wave function. So that, of course, complicates matters in that we've got a range of values of K and therefore a range of different energies associated with the wave packet. And each one of those energies will see effectively a slightly different barrier because we've got E minus V zero, but because we've got a range of energies, the E, the e is varying. But still, we can think of this in the context of the, 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 the mean energy of the, of the wave packet. And that's given by its group velocity. And so the group velocity is the rate at which the, the wave packet itself or the peak of the wave packet moves as compared to the phase velocity, which is the rate at which the individual um, wiggles of the various plane waves move. But the group, we have a well-defined group velocity in terms of how that wave packet moves. So I've set up a simulation here. Going back to the simulations we had for wave packet back in chapter three and a number of videos ago, where we can take that wave packet and instead of having it move in free space, we can have it impinge on a barrier and watch the tunneling process in, in, in action. And actually the exponential dependence is retained and we can gain an awful lot of insight into watching in real time as it were, the dynamics of a wave packet um, impinging on a barrier and tunneling through a barrier. So on the screen right now is we've got a Gaussian wave packet. Let me, I'll first of all reduce the energy to zero. So this at the moment is just a pure Gaussian wave function. Here's it's uh, the modular squared of the momentum representation of the probability density. This, it's a bit naughty of me, but I should uh, specify that this this value here is k is equal to zero. Notice that we've got an even function, it's Gaussian, so a Gaussian in the position representation, trans Fourier transforms to a Gaussian in the momentum representation. It's an even function, which means there are as many um, values of positive k as there are values of negative k. So our mean momentum, our mean k value is zero. So our mean momentum is zero. And you'll remember that if we now take our Gaussian wave pack and multiply through by a plane wave e to the i k zero x, where k zero x is defining that group um, velocity. Let me just do that. Let me, well, let me just change this to say zero point. It's a very small energy. So now, instead of having just the pure Gaussian envelope, what we have is our Gaussian envelope, our Gaussian function multiplied by e to the i k zero x, where that k zero is defining the momentum of this wave packet, the net momentum of the wave packet. Notice we've now got a net momentum. Remember zeros here. So we've got the mean value of our momentum is positive. Therefore, it's going to move in the positive x direction. And by increasing that energy, you'll see that the number of wiggles in the wave function increases. That's because we're changing the value of k, we're changing the value of spatial frequencies. That's exactly what we'd expect. And we can also change the barrier width. As you can see what I'm doing there, it's moving back and forth. In terms of the units here, um, I've included in the blog post associated with this a little bit of information about the units. Don't get too hung up on the units. Again, I'm using h bar is equal to m is equal to 1. And the barrier height, when I use those units in terms of those uh, normalized units, let's put it this way, is equal to 0 0.1.
So what we really should think about is that, again, think in terms of the epsilon we discussed or I've just discussed on the blackboard, it's really about the ratio of the energy of the particles to the barrier height. So if our barrier, if our barrier height is set at 0 0.1, let's set this to, um, well, close to the barrier height. We'll set this as 0 0.09. So this is the energy of our particles now is 90% of the the barrier height and so we're going to see the um wave packet is going to impinge on that barrier and we're going to see what's happened given that the energy is quite high we would expect that the transmission coefficient would be relatively high okay so let's run this and what you're going to see is the wave packet is going to impinge on the barrier this is telling us the um this is going to tell us the transmission coefficient it's basically telling us the amount of the probability density that's on one side of the barrier as compared to the amount that's on the other side of the barrier. So you can see it's now hitting, it's now impinging upon the bar barrier, it's tunneling through the barrier. Some of the wave packet is getting reflected, but the majority of it is getting transmitted. And you can see that we've got wave packet moving off in this direction and then the reflected part of the wave packet moving in the other direction. We've got a transmission coefficient basically of 85% under these conditions with regard to the wave packet energy. Notice also what happened to in terms of the momentum representation. So we've now got a positive, remember zeros here, and a negative momentum. And that's because we've got, due to the reflection, we've got our wave packet moving in this direction, negative momentum, and we've got our wave packet moving in this direction, positive momentum. Okay, let's stop that. And let's, we're going to repeat it now. That was an 85% transmission. Let's make it a really small energy. So now, instead of having 90% of the barrier height, the energy of the tunneling electrons, the energy of the tunneling wave packet, doesn't have to be electrons, but I'm an electron person. Everything you do is all about tunneling electrons. But the wave function, the wave packet for the tunneling um, particles is now, now is associated with an energy which is 10% of the barrier height. So let's run this again. Well, first thing to note is that our wave packet is moving much more slowly, which is absolutely what we'd expect. It's got a much smaller energy, much smaller kinetic energy. Therefore, its velocity is going to be smaller. And it's going to impinge on the barrier. It's going to take a little time to do that. But what we would expect now is that our transmission coefficient should be significantly smaller. And notice that because everything's happening a lot more slowly now, notice what's happening. You're getting the ripples in the probability density arise because you've got the ingoing, just as we descri I described on the blackboard, we've just got the ingoing wave, we've got the outgoing wave, and it's the combination of those two that gives rise to these ripples in the probability density. Notice what's happening now is because we initially just had one uh, positive momentum. We now have... Um, Negative momentum because it's moving in that direction. Our transmission coefficient is very small. As opposed to 85% last time, now we've got 5% transmission through the barrier because the energy of the wave packet is so much smaller. Tunnels off and continues on its merry way. Now if we increase the barrier width, let's keep the wave packet energy the same we should be able to reduce that. That um, transmission coefficient should fall off, falls off exponentially with barrier width, so we should expect virtually nothing to be transmitted under these conditions. Okay, it's impinging on the barrier now. Starting to impinge on the barrier. And we're gonna see the ripples in the probability density. Yeah, because we've got the, this is a wave packet. So it comprises a collection of plane waves, but each one of those plane waves has got its own wave number, spatial frequency. Um, so for each one of those, we've got an ingoing e to the i kx and an outgoing e to the minus i kx. And when we take the sum of those, we get this cosine-like dependence, which has given us, it's just as we saw on the blackboard, in terms of the probability density. So now, we're down to um, 0.2%, 0 0.002. We were at 5%, we're now down to 0.2%. If we increase the barrier width further, well, let's do that, and we can block everything completely. So 
So now it's impinging on the barrier, which is much thicker. And we're going to see that our wave packet just gets reflected. Our transmission coefficient is going to be pretty much zero in this case because the barrier width is so high and therefore a transmission coefficient which exponentially depends on the barrier width is going to drop off to nothing. Yes, it looks like nothing is going to be transmitted in this case. So I say nothing. Of course, it's an exponential dependence. Um, if I were to expand this out to six, nine decimal places, we might see that at the limit of, at the level of 0.001%, that there is some degree of transmission. And only in the limit of an infinite barrier width would there be absolutely zero tunneling. Okay, so that simulation is online. Have fun with it. Try changing the barrier width. Try changing the energy of the, um, the mean energy of the wave packet. And um, see what effects that has on the tunneling process. It gives you a good insight into just what's going on. That's very, very difficult to capture um, with drawings on the, on, the, on the blackboard. Sketches and drawings on the blackboard. Okay, let's go down to the lab now and actually do a tunneling measurement. Let's measure the transmission coefficient for real in an experiment by looking at the tunneling current, looking at the flow of tunneling ele electrons through the junction in a scanning tunneling microscope between the tip and the sample, where the barrier height is defined by the properties of the tip and the sample, the electronic properties, and the barrier width is defined by the separation of the tip and the sample. So I'm downstairs in one of the research labs at the moment and in here we've got housed not just one but two scanning tunneling microscopes. One's directly behind me, the other larger one is over there. We're going to focus on this one directly behind me. And at the moment, if I just take the camera off here, at the moment we are scanning a silicon surface and those rows you can see, there's quite a lot of noise on there, but that's okay. The rows you can see, these are atomic rows. It's not the finest image ever seen, but um, these rows running up diagonally across the image are atomic rows. They're atomic rows on a silicon surface. And in here is the business end of the microscope. Let me show you. Okay, so first of all, this is an ultra-high vacuum system. Inside all that stainless steel is a vacuum comparable to that. You get, well, perhaps not in deep space, but certainly on the surface of the moon, a uh, pressure that's about 13 orders of magnitude lower than atmospheric pressure. And the reason we need that pressure is that we want to look at surfaces with very high atomic, and indeed better than atomic resolution. So we need to keep those surfaces pristine, therefore we need them in a vacuum. But the business end of that system, the microscope itself, the scanning tunneling microscope, is over it. Here, well, we can see the piezoelectric tube. We can see the electrodes that we use to apply voltages to the tube, the piezoelectric element, to move the tip around. And we can see the tip just about. We can also see the sample, but the sample is facing downward. I'll show you a better view of the, the tip in a second. Point tip is pointing upwards. And so those are our atomic rows. And that green line moving across the screen is the current line that the uh, um, microscope is doing. It overwrites the last image, so it's just basically re-scanning re the same area over and over and over. And we can see the atomic rows. And the tunnel current we are measuring now, so the current of electrons, tunneling current of electrons is, there we go. 0.17 nanoamps or 170 picoamps. This is our tip, zoomed in heavily, and this region here is our sample, and this is the reflection of our tip. And so what we do is by eye, we move the tip in with a motor, an in-vacuum motor, that allows us to position the tip and the sample very, very, very close to each other. And once we get it very close, which is still very, very far away in terms of tunneling, we switch over to computer control and we let the computer step the tip in. Let me just zoom in a little bit on that on the screen, so you can see that. So, tip, reflection of tip, and that's just an optical image from a video camera. Nothing exciting there at all. And the tip is actually moving back and forth at the moment, but because the distance it moving is 20 nanometers, the scan size is 20 nanometers, 
you're obviously not going to see that on an uh, optical microscope image. Atomic rose snaking across the image. There are some defects there as well. This is an adsorbate, some contaminant that's in there. This is a fairly old sample. So what we're going to do now is measure the tunnel current that flows as a function of the barrier width. So this links directly to what I've just been discussing on the board in terms of the dependence of the transmission on the barrier width. So we're keeping a fixed barrier height in this case, and that's defined by the properties of the sample. We won't go into that. You'll see a lot more about that in solid state next year. For now, don't worry about it. The, ba the, the, the barrier is really set by the properties of the sample. The energy is set by basically the voltage um, I supply between the tip and the sample that controls the energy of the tunneling electrons. We're going to look at a fixed energy of electrons and a fixed barrier height, and we're going to vary the barrier width. So we should expect an exponential dependence of the tunnel current, which is effectively the probability for those electrons to tunnel through um, the transmission, on the width of the barrier. So let's just see that in action. Now it's stepping the tip in, and you can see the tunnel current grow exponentially as it steps the tip in and measures the tunnel current at each step until it gets to the end and it's measured the tunnel current in this case of around two nano amps and you can see that variation that exponential dependence quite clearly so physics works works in the lab experimental physics really does work and all the stuff we've just been doing on the blackboard and all those simulations in the real world when applied to the real world quantum mechanics works and it works incredibly well so it was one final thing, let's compare the simulations, the results from the simulations of the tunneling process with the Gaussian wave packet with the experimental data. Just a qualitative um, comparison to see just how similar they are. So here we have the transmission coefficient versus the barrier width and each one of these blue points I've just run the simulation and measured the transmission via the just taking getting the code to integrate the area under the probability density curve on the right hand side of the barrier. So the amount of um, the probability density that exists on the other side of the barrier, the wave function starts normalized, the wave function stays normalized. So um, just looking at the area under that uh, is, is a very good way of measuring transmission as a function of barrier width. So each one of those blue points is one of the, the measurements directly from the simulation. The red line is a fit, an exponentially decaying fit to that data. It does a reasonably good job. And then just for comparison, what we had down in the lab in terms of the variation in tunnel current over a, a 0.5 nanometer, five angstrom to use the other unit that is beloved of condensed matter physicists and particularly crystallographers, the angstrom, which is 0.1 of a nanometer. So either 0 0.5 nanometers or five angstroms range. And you can see the exponential increase in the tunnel current in both the experiment and the simulation. Okay, my sincere apologies for the long delay in getting these videos uploaded. Again, it's not for want of trying, but I know it's frustrating for you. Believe me, I share your frustration, particularly when this thing packed up for a good... So just to give you a schedule for the remaining vi videos and the remaining content in the course, something which I know a number of you have been waiting for uh, with bated breath, and that's Dirac notation, bracket notation, and we're going to look at matrix mechanics. Next uh, couple of videos, we're going to focus on two-dimensional particle in a box, uh, particularly making more of those links to scanning tunneling microscope images, where we can image that probability density in the box. So we, we look at that, we look at the, the realization in nanoscience and nanotechnology and condensed matter physics, how we can actually realize different quantum wells. And then finally, the last part of the module, we'll move on to thinking about conservation laws a little bit. We've already talked a little bit about in terms of conservation of mass and continuity, the continuity equation. We've still got to resolve that conundrum about the wave packet dispersing in space, but the momentum representation of the wave function, not the modulus squared of the momentum representation of the wave function not changing at all, and how that apparently seems to go against the idea of wider in position space, narrow in momentum space. 
We'll get to that. It's an important conservation law built into that as well. Talk about something called Nurture's Theorem. And that's how we'll close up the, the end of this module. Do not worry. Do not panic. We will get the material done. You're not going to miss anything out. I know there have been scheduling issues, let's put it that way, in terms of the uploads. But we've done, we've covered the material we need to cover at this point. And over the next few, few weeks, two to three weeks, we'll cover the remainder of the material. We'll get it done and you'll be in a good place in terms of starting next semester. And as I said, I will be uploading Q&A videos as well. I will also be uploading more worked example videos and then in the run up to the exams and even a little bit before that, I'll be uploading exam run throughs. So, so just don't, I keep, this is my perpetual perennial message is don't panic, it's okay. And as ever, just get in touch if you want to talk about anything, if you want to ask questions about the notes, if you're a little bit worried about how the course is going, if you find it overwhelming, if you find it underwhelming and you'd like more material, any other things, just get in touch. I'll do my best to, to respond to you as quickly as I can. Okay, good night. It's been a long, long day. I will see you for the next synchronous session. Bye.